Okay, if you have your Bible, please open with me to the book of John, John chapter 8. John chapter 8, if you don't have your Bible, you may uh, look with me in the screen, but it's always better to have your own Bible so you check out uh, what's being uh, said, because our trust is in God and God's Word, and this is why we are like the Bereans. We're faithful and diligent to see and to check out everything by the Word of God, because the Word of God is our final authority for our faith and practice. So John chapter 8, verses 12 to 20 will be our main verses. I'll be going through verse by verse, but I'll be cross-referencing other verses. I'll be going through it quick, so I would suggest that you look, I'll have the cross-reference verses on the screen, but you just uh, stay open with, uh, in John chapter 8, verses 12 to 20. I'll read the verses, pray, and then preach the word of God this morning. So John chapter 8, verse 12, the word of God there reads, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I, am, where I come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I, come, where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me you would have known my father also. And in verse 20, the word of God there says, These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. This time I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful for your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for his miraculous birth, we're so thankful that though he was eternal son of God and remain God, he became a human and lived that perfect life that we could not live. We're so thankful for his sacrificial death on the cross and the power of his resurrection. We're so thankful for your Holy Spirit, the giver of life, our comforter and our teacher. So thankful for your preserved, inspired, written word that you have left for us. You have given us these narratives that we would look in your word and it'd be like a mirror unto us, that we would see ourselves, we would see our sin, but we would also see the Savior. We would be convicted, but we would also be comforted by your grace and through the finished work on the cross. Pray, Father God, that we would... This morning, not just be hearers of the word, but doers. We're so thankful that you give us spiritual sight. We pray for any precious soul here this morning that has not yet been saved by the light of the world, has not yet received spiritual sight, has not yet received this beautiful eternal life that begins the day that you save us. We pray that you would give them understanding, that you would open their heart, that you would bring them to their knees to see their sin, only to see the finished work on the cross. Pray that you'd be honoured and glorified this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'll just go uh, start from verse 12. Look with me there in verse 12. The word of God there says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. As Jesus had done previously, he uses the metaphor of light and darkness. In verse 12, Jesus says that he is the light of this world. Just as there is only one sun that provides light for our planet, there is only one Savior who brings the light of salvation to a sin-darkened world. By saying, I am the light of the world, Jesus is saying that he is the one and only remedy for sin. He is the only one that gives sight to spiritually blind people. The metaphor of darkness 
throughout the scriptures is used to denote sin. Someone who is living in darkness is someone who is living a life of immoral sin. We also see in the scriptures that someone living in darkness is also someone living with a darkened mind which cripples the intellect and causes one to drown in ignorance and unbelief. It causes one to not be able to see and walk right as we've seen with the illustration that Brother Murun gave us. Notice with me the verse again in John 8, 12. He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. The word follow in this context is synonymous with believe. Yeah, that is what the word Christian means. It means a follower of Christ. He's saying, he who follows me, he who is a true Christian, he who has his trust in me, this person, the Christian, the follower of Christ, shall not walk in darkness. That's what the word of God teaches. Jesus says, not everyone that calls me a Christian or calls me Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. Someone who is born into a Christian home, though that's a wonderful thing. Someone who is raised in church, even raised in this church, it's irrelevant which church they're raised in. And thank God it's a blessed thing for children to be raised in church. I'm just saying, someone who's born in a Christian home or even raised in this church but walks in darkness slash lives a life of habitual sin is not a true Christian, according to the Word of God. Amen. That's because a true Christian is a follower of Christ and a follower of Christ does not walk in darkness. That's what verse 12 is saying. It says, he who follows me, that is a follower of Christ, the Christian, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Jesus says the same thing in John 12, 46. Look with me there on the screen. And it says, or oh, this is the Lord Jesus Christ uh, saying these words. He says, I come a light into the world that whoever believes on me should not abide in darkness, should no lo longer live a life of darkness. This is good news. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the power of Christ's death and resurrection. Jesus has the power to both save us from the penalty of sin and also save us from a habitual life of sin. His grace is an amazing grace. It's not this cheap grace that says, here, have a ticket to heaven, but still live a dark life. No, his saving grace is amazing. It's powerful. It gives us eternal life. And that eternal life begins the day he saves us. And that eternal life here on this earth is an abundant life and a life to the full. It's not a life in darkness. Beloved and precious souls, I don't say this in a condemning way, but rather in a way of love. You are either a follower of Christ or you are still in darkness. Notice with me how the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. If you're quick, you can turn there, but keep your finger on our main passage. Or you can look with me there on the screen. In Ephesians 5, verse 5, it says, For this you know, that no fornicator, that is a sexually immoral person, our world tells us it's normal to have um, uh, sexual relations outside of marriage but the word of God tells us that that's, that's, that's darkness that's sin that's immoral and he says this for this you know that no fornicator unclean person that's all of us by nature that's me and you we are sinful by nature that no fornicator unclean person notice no covetous man who is an idolater a covetous person is the exact opposite to a content person a covetous person is never content. They always got on their mind, um, uh, I want this bigger house and bigger boat and bigger car and so forth. And it becomes idolatry. The things of this world are what he idolizes. But a content man is happy in God. He's content with the very presence of God. He's content with the life of Christ. That's all he needs. The saying he... Neither nor a covetous man who is an idolater, notice what it says, this is the word of God, it's black and white, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And notice how he says in verse 6, 
False teachers might say, um, uh, you're all good, everyone's the winner, everyone just goes to heaven. But that's not the word of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, which things? Sin. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Then notice in verse 7, therefore do not be partakers with them. With who? With those that are in the dark. And it says in verse 8, for you were once darkness. You see this throughout the scripture, the metaphor of light and darkness. You were once darkness. In other words, he's talking to the Ephesians here and they're Christians. And he's saying, um, we're all the same. We're all born sinners. And you were once living in darkness. That's all of us. But notice, but now you are light in the Lord. That's what happens when Jesus saves a soul. He brings them from the darkness to the light. It's like the illustration we just seen. He, he grabs them. He's the light of the world. He opens their eyes and he guides them. But you are now light in the Lord. And notice what he instructs the Ephesians, what he instructs us. He says, walk as children of light. Live a godly life in this dark world. Why? For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. We don't live a righteous life to get right with God. We live a righteous life because He's brought us into the light. It's by His grace, and it's the fruit of the Spirit of God that gives us goodness, righteousness, and truth. In verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And notice what he says in verse 11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Saying, you've come from a dark life, don't go back to that dark life. Now, of course, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ sat and ate and drank with sinners, and we ought to do that. Our houses should be open for the most vile of sinners, because we're all sinners. And we ought to eat and drink with sinners in that sense, but we ought not to have fellowship with them in the sense that we go sort of to the nightclub and to the pubs and clubs and sort of fellowship with them in the midst of their sin. Yes, Jesus ate and drank with sinners, but he was not at the party where Herodias' daughter danced in an ungodly way. No, we have, un, uh, we have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We influence them. They don't influence us. We bring them to the light, yes. That's how we have communion with them. But we don't live a life of sin with them. A true believer, rather than living a life in the dark, lives a righteous life in the light. Notice with me again this beautiful verse, John 8, 12. What a powerful verse in our main passage. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The light of life, the last three words there in the verse, is the life-giving grace of God that lasts for eternity. Notice how it says that he shall have the light of life. The light of life is something that we have, not something that we work for. A Christian lives a righteous life in the light, not to earn the grace of God, but because he has received the free gift of God. Our good works are a fruit of the grace of God. They're not there to earn the grace of God. The light of Christ is, is life-giving, and those that have it live a life that is in the light because they are empowered by the light. They are regenerated by the light and they are empowered and guided by the light. Amen. Notice with me one more thing in John 8, 12. By saying, I am the light of the world, Jesus is claiming to be God. This is how the Jews understood him throughout the gospel. This is how they understood his claim and this is one excuse as to why they wanted to kill him. The Jews knew, the unbelieving Jews or the Jewish leadership, the Pharisees, which was a Jewish sect of the day, the Jews knew that the metaphor of light was used of God in the Old Testament and Jesus here applies it or uses it to himself. No other prophet ever said that they were light, the light of salvation or the light that gives spiritual life. Notice with me in Psalm 27.1, and you see this metaphor used of Almighty God throughout the Old Testament. This is one of many verses that says the Lord, that is Jehovah God, that is God eternally existing as three persons. The Lord is my light and my salvation. And notice what 1 John 1, 5 says, the same, uh, same writer as this gospel in his letters. He says in 1 John 1, 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 
Jesus, the eternal Son of God, is the one and only life-giving light of this world. True believers follow the light and live in the light. But I just want you to notice how Christ-rejecting unbelievers respond to the light, being the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I look at the response of the Christ-rejecting Pharisees, they were unbelievers, they said they were the children of God. They all looked good on the outward. They were the religious leaders of the day, but they were Christ-rejectors. Before I look at their response to the light of God, notice firstly why they respond the way they do. And this was our Bible reading, but I'll just read it again. Look with me in John chapter 3, verse 19. It says, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Notice verse 20. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. The reason why an unbeliever, a Christ-rejecting unbeliever, hates the light is because it exposes sin. As Paul Washer put it, the reason why people hate the cross is because it tells them that they are wrong. That's a Christ rejecter, but notice in verse 21, but he who does the truth, a true believer, comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So the light of God causes people to respond in two ways. One says... Turn off that light, you're exposing my filth. Another one says, thank you so much for revealing my sin. And it brings them to repentance and they look to the cross and they see the grace of God and they see the marvelous gift of God. And they see Christ Jesus on the cross who died in their place, who rose again to give them eternal life, to give them that abundant life, that life to the full that begins the day that he saves them. Notice with me the corrupt religious leaders, the Christ rejectors, how they respond to the light of the world. I've just showed you why they respond this way, but notice how how they do it. Because when someone's spiritually blind, their mind is darkened and they, they twist things. They twist the truth, they're big fat gaslighters. They project their own sin on others. It's twisted. We all struggle with that as sinners. But they drown in it. They reject the light. Notice how they respond. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. They falsely accuse him. How twisted is that? The sinless Savior never done one sin. And they have the nerve to falsely accuse him. Instead of humbly repenting of their own sin, they hide their sin and project it on him. They are falsely accusing him of boasting in something that they say he is not. They are saying to him that you claim that you are the light of the world, but you're the only one saying this about yourself. They're accusing him of self-appointment. Notice Jesus' response in verse 14. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going But you do not know where I come from and where I'm going. Jesus' response is that his origin is divine because he is divine. Jesus is saying in verse 14 in responding to them that even if he testified of himself, his testimony is sufficient because he is divine. He goes on to say in verse 15, you judge, he's talking to the Christ-rejecting Pharisees, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. In verse 14, Jesus tells them that they are ignorant of his origin and ignorant of his destiny. And then in verse 15, he says that they judge according to the flesh. Judging according to the flesh stems from a sinful, condemning, and blurred vision. It is an unrighteous form of judgment that only judges the outward appearance, but not the substance. They judged his outward appearance and only saw a man. And they only saw a man who they considered a nobody. They saw a man that they considered was, of, was not of a noble birth. They, they, they considered his parents as, a, as nobodies. They considered the village he was from in Nazareth as a nobody village. 
They wanted a warrior. They wanted a political warrior that would deliver them from their here and now political woes. But Jesus, of course, was the Lamb of God that came to take away the sin of the world, but they did not want that. And therefore, they viewed him as a nobody. They judged his outward appearance, saw a man, but they missed the fact that he was the eternal Son of God come in the flesh. Jesus said the same sort of thing about judging in the chapter before in John 7, 24. He says, do not judge. He's talking to the Christ-rejecting Pharisees here also. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Judging is not inherently evil. He makes a distinction here in 724 with a righteous judgment and an unrighteous judgment. When Jesus says in John 815, look with me, I judge no one. He's saying that he judges no one unrighteously, superficially, and externally as the Pharisees did. We'll see in a moment that he does judge the heart, righteously judges the heart, because he knows the hearts of all people. But he is saying, I judge no one responding to their unrighteous judgment. Notice with me firstly in verse 16, And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. Jesus is saying that his judgment is true and righteous because he is of the same will and judgment with the Father. In these verses, Jesus claims to be the one true God, yet a distinct person from the Father and co-equal with the Father. We see that throughout the Gospel of John. And he's at it again. He presses the point, notice with me in 8.17, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Notice with me who the two persons that testify to the claims of the man Christ Jesus according to Jesus. Notice with me in 8.18. He says, I... I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Cover to cover, the Bible reveals the most fundamental truth in the Christian faith. Cover to cover, the Bible reveals, and we see it in these these verses also, reveals the true God as one God who eternally exists as three distinct persons Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The religious leaders don't like the claims of Christ, so they ridicule him. Notice with me, verse 19, Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. You know what Jesus is doing here? He's righteously judging their hearts. He is judging them By saying to them, you're not even believers. Jesus righteously judges the Pharisees with a righteous judgment exposing their hearts. And by the way, he's the only one that can judge the heart because he's the only one that knows the hearts of all people. Not only did they judge according to outward appearance, but they deceived the people by appearing to be godly on the outside. But Jesus said, Elsewhere, inwardly, they are truly wolves. Jesus confronts and exposes their hearts by telling them that though they claim to be the children of God, they don't even know God. Jesus asserts that if they had really known God the Father, they would know God the Son, for though they are distinct persons, they are one true God. Of course, together with the Holy Spirit and Uh, The gospel writer will talk about the Holy Spirit as we come to the um, chapters in the coming months or coming weeks. This truth infuriates them and they respond with wanting to kill him. That's what light does. That's what truth does. That's what happened when Stephen, the first Christian martyr, spoke the truth of the word of God, spoke the words of light, and they gnashed their teeth and wanted to kill him and killed him. And this is how the Christ rejectors respond to Christ. They wanted to kill him. They begin planning to kill him. Notice in John 8, 20, these words spoke Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him. They wanted to. But no one laid hands on him. Notice why. For his hour had not yet come. Christ is sovereign. They wanted to lay hands on him 
to kill him, but his hour had not yet come. Jesus will die in the hands of sinners according to his own plan, purpose, and timing. In closing, we see throughout the scriptures that there are only two ways to respond to the light of the world. One can either respond as the Pharisees who hate the light because it exposes their evil deeds. Or as a true disciple who loves the light because it exposes sin only to cleanse sin, exposes sin only to show him the worth of the cross, only to show him the sinless Savior. My open question to each and every one of us is this. Have you responded? How, sorry, how have you responded to the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you like the Christ-rejecting Pharisees who claimed to be the children of God but were still in hidden darkness? Yeah, they were churchgoers, so to speak, but they were still in darkness. It does not make sense to live an ungodly life in darkness throughout the week and just come to church as if it's a bundy on, bundy off type religion. You're either in the light or in darkness. You're either a child of God or not. Have you been transformed by the light of God whereby you follow him and you no longer walking in darkness? True believer is empowered by the grace of God and is in the light and does not live a habitual life of sin. Yes, we struggle with sin. I struggle with sin every day. And I sin every day. But I repent every day. But a habitual life of sin is an unrepentant life in sin. Before God saved me, I would do drugs and get drunk and do all these kind of dark, sinful things. But I was unrepentant. I had an indifferent attitude towards the light. But when Christ saved my heart, gave me a new heart, gave me spiritual sight, I seen the beauty of the cross. I no longer desired these other things. When I struggled and slipped, I was repentant. I hated the old life. That's what I mean by habitual life of sin. Beloved, precious souls, you're either in the light or you're not. The gospel writer in his letters said some very strong words. They're offensive to the Christ rejecter, but they are beautiful to the child of God. Notice what he says in 1 John 2, 3. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. What the gospel writer is saying here by the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is this is how we know we are true Christians. It's not, we don't know we're true Christians if we're raised in the church, if we've been baptized, or if we've said the sinner's prayer without repentance. No, we know that we know him. We know that we are true Christians if we keep his commandments. It's not saying that we keep his commandments to earn favor with him. It's not saying that we keep his commandments so that we become Christians. It's saying, no, the one that has been gifted with eternal life, the one that is a Christian, has a desire to keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. It's something that he desires to do because he is in love with his creator. He says in the next verse, he who says, I know him. In other words, he who says, I know Christ or I'm a follower of Christ. He who says, I'm a Christian and does not keep his commandments. The word of God says this, not me. He's a liar. And the truth is not in him. You know who he's lying to? Himself. Verse 5, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know we are in him. This is how we know. This is how we get the assurance of salvation. We know that because when he gives us a new heart, he gives us a desire, he makes us fall in love with him. And just like a, a, a husband wants to please his wife, a child of God wants to please his heavenly father. Notice in verse 6, he who says he abides in him or himself also to walk just as he walked. Just as the sun gives light to the planet and the moon reflects the light of the sun, Christ is the light of this world from a spiritual perspective. And we are like the moon, we reflect his light. And he says to us in the sermon of the of the. A sermon on the mount, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know why they glorify the Father in heaven? Because they see it's a reflection of the light of God. Verse 
Notice in 1 John 2, 9, he goes on to say, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Someone that's unrepentant and has hate in their heart has not experienced the grace of God. I'm not asking if you've been baptized in the church or born into a Christian home or even said the sinner's prayer without repentance as a kid or even as an adult. I am asking if you are walking in darkness or walking in light. We've seen what Christ has said. We've seen what John has said. We've seen what Paul said. Notice with me what Peter says when he uses this metaphor of light and darkness. And I'll close on this. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen generation. He's talking about the true children of God that are in the light. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. That you may proclaim the praises of him. Notice, and notice who does the calling. As Brother Maroon um, uh, illustrated, it's Christ that opens our eyes, that guides us. It's he's the one that calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Say that you proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then in that same context, he says in verse 11, Beloved, beloved, you who have been called out of darkness and into light, you that have been saved from a life of sin and power to live in the light, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Have you experienced this radical change of Christ? Has he healed you from your spiritual blindness is my question this morning. If he, has, if he, if he hasn't or if you haven't yet experienced this, I beg you this morning to respond. And he tells us, he gives the open invitation to respond to the work of the cross with faith and repentance. At this time, I invite you to bow your head and close your eyes in a word of prayer. I'll just give you a few moments to meditate and then Brother Maroon will come. He'll pray for us and, and close our service. Father, we love you, Lord, and we thank you, Father, for giving us your Son, Lord, your Son who is the light to this world, Father, the light of redemption, Father. We thank you, Lord, that your Son not only called us, Father, for those of us here that are redeemed, Lord, not only called us into your saving light, Father, but it's that same light of Christ, Father, not only saves us, but sanctifies us, Lord. It's that same light, Father, that as we walk hand in hand with Christ each and every day, Father, changes us in more and more like him to become more and more like Jesus, Father, that our character, our person changes, Father. I pray, Lord, for each and every brother and sister here this morning, Father, that uh, as they go through that sanctification process, that changing and refining process, Father, they may continue to strive to walk in your light, Father, to walk hand in hand in Christ, to walk hand in hand, Father, to walk uh, each day, Father, meditating in the written word, Father, that reveals to us the living word of Christ. I pray, Lord, that as we struggle through uh, the, the, the many temptations and trials and, and uh, enticements, Father, this world has to offer, Father, that you might help us to keep our eyes focused upon you, to keep our eyes set upon your light, which is Christ, Father, that we might walk through this life. And as we do so, Father, we might be like mirrors and reflect the light of Christ to those around us, reflect the who Christ is, his personhood, Father, to those around us, Lord. And as people may, as people look upon us, Father, they may see Christ's reflection in and through our lives, in the way we conduct ourselves, the way we walk, the way we behave, the way we speak, the way we raise our families, our children, Father. We just, we pray, Father, we're, we truly are a needy people, Lord. Lord, we need you not just for salvation, we need you for sanctification. And I pray, Father, that as you... You provided for us for your saving grace. You may provide and strengthen each and every family, each and every person here, Lord, that they may look and walk in the light, Father, to give you glory, praise, and honor, Father. For that is our purpose, Lord, is to give you glory, praise, and honor, Father. And we ask and we beg, Lord, and we plead, Father, for your hand on our lives that we might glorify you and give glory to the name of Christ. Father, I pray for 
uh, the, the, each and every person here. I pray, Lord, that as we go through this week, Lord, you may give us an opportunity, Father, to reflect your light to, to others in, in and around us, Father, in our immediate circle, Lord God. I pray for the children, Father, that you might give us guidance and wisdom for the parents here, Lord, to, to raise our children in the, in the light, Father, and they may see Christ for, for the light that he is, Lord God, and that everything else is just but darkness, Father. Father, I pray, Lord God, that for any person here that may be struggling with sin, Father, you may draw us to repentance, Lord God, and help us to overcome for your name's sake and for your glory. Father, I pray for uh, the families, Lord, and the people here, Father, for your name's sake, that you may help us to go from strength to strength and glory to glory, Father. Your, your name and your church may, uh, may give you praise, honour and glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.